The Ruby Volume 7 commentator notes are out, and my god, you can't make this terrible stuff up. Hey, what is going on, everybody? How are you all doing today? I hope you all are having a wonderful and fantastic day today, and if not, hopefully you all will have a better tomorrow. So Ruby Volume 7, the commentator notes are out, and my god, <laughs> these things are absolutely terrible. <laughs> these are bad. And I mean, really bad. We're going to go over these terrible notes. I mean, Volume 7, in my opinion, which I'm sure a majority of you already know, I, I hate it. I, I cannot stand Volume 7. I think it's trash. It's the worst volume of Ruby, in my opinion, ever made. I mean, and it beats Volume 5. I think it's trash. <laughs> and these commentator notes just prove the writers don't know what they're doing. And this is nothing. And I mean nothing but damage control. It is absolute garbage there's even some things in these commentator notes that just nobody cares <laughs> they're just it's just awful and and volume eight's right around the corner and yes i am going to review it so i'm going to torture myself so you don't have to torture yourself but yeah so you know the other thing i just wanted to bring this up before we get into the commentator notes if you look at the volume seven poster and volume eight poster there's not much difference Seriously, this doesn't get me hyped at all. It just makes me look at it and go, oh, look, fan art. Like, <laughs> I don't, this doesn't hype me for volume eight at all. Then again, you know, doesn't, doesn't, period. But look at the poster for volume five. Even volume five's poster was better than volume seven and eight. I mean, yeah, volume five is trash, but at least it could get you hyped for what could be coming, right? You know, it could give you some anticipation. I don't feel anything when I look at Volume 7 or Volume 8's posters. I don't feel a single thing, because it doesn't give me anything to look forward to like Volume 5 did. I just wanted to point this out, just to show you how everything just collided and went just completely downhill. <laughs> Even the posters are reflecting that. Alright, so let's go ahead and get on with this roast. So the first one that we're looking at here. The penguins that we see for a moment were possibly going to be grim penguins. Oh my lord, Grim Penguins! I, I don't care. Like, th they weren't even going to do it. They just stood there. <laughs> why Why is that even important? I just, I, I mean, I'm serious. The penguins that were there, they just stood there while the convoy drove by in the distance. I mean, seriously. What importance would Grim Penguins even have? Grim Penguins have no importance to me. I mean, then again, I don't think they have any importance to anybody because they would just be fodder anyways. I mean, because everybody knows Grim are weak. They just get killed in like one to two shots. I mean, so seriously, what value would a Grim Penguin have? I, I mean, I just genuinely ask that. I don't see how that's important. There was also no montage in Chapter 5, just them sitting around a table talking about what they did. I don't think anybody thought it was a montage. <laughs> like, the montage was in, what, Chapter 4? So I don't think anybody cared. And who, who would wonder about that anyways? Fiona's semblance was originally going to be Torchwick semblance. And it was called Deep Pockets. But... They never found a moment for him to use it, so they decided he could be a great example of how some people don't unlock their semblances. I wonder how true that actually is. Because that's the thing, these writers come up with stuff off the top of their head to save their asses all the time. All the time. So this shit is nothing new. I mean, yeah, that'd be cool, but here's the thing. Deep Pocket sounds terrible. Why don't you just call it Infinite Pocket? Because, you know, it'd be like the Infinite Pocket ability in cartoons and whatnot. That would have been a lot better and it would have made a lot more sense than Deep Pockets. Also, just use it on Salem. I mean, seriously, there's your end game right there. Just use it on Salem. If she can absorb humans, that is, you know, then use it on Salem. It would be GG if her semblance can do that. The arm robot Pietro has in his office was originally going to have more of a character like the robotic arm and Tony, like Tony Stark has. What? Why? Like, at this point, see, this is the thing. What they always do is they try to take from other things, rather than trying to make Ruby their own thing, and then they're just like, oh, this is a cool idea, let's implement it! <laughs> There's no originality. I mean, seriously. Like, what, the robotic arm having character. What? Why? That is so pointless. What, this is horrible. Why? Why? That, that's so bad. That's terrible. Watt's gun was inspired by a 20-shot revolver Carrie saw on Reddit. What? Really? You, so you saw a revolver on Reddit 
And you were like, oh man, that's what Watch should have. You know, instead of him being like the puppet master, which could have been a lot cooler, you know, but like, you know, kind of controlling things behind the scenes, because that's basically what he did. So instead of being a puppet master like he could have been, which would have been a lot cooler, you gave him a revolver that only had 20 shots. 20 shots. He had no ammo to reload. That is horrible. <laughs> What's he going to do? Pistol whip somebody after he loses the shots? Because Watts has no physical strength. So that's just stupid. That's... God. That's horrible. And those, you know, shields or whatever. Man, that was that's disappointing. Clover has no idea who he's up against with Tyrion, and thinks of Crow as a big threat, as well as Tyrion manipulating Crow. Tyrion didn't manipulate Crow, he just decided to do it. Like, are you, are you kidding me? He was already ready to fight Clover. And then that's when Tyrion comes into the battle. So, to say that he's manipulating Crow, no. Crow was already fighting Clover before <laughs> Tyrion even came in. You gotta be kidding me. And then it was a three-way brawl. There, <laughs> and then, of course, that's when it came down to Crow and Tyrion teaming up. This sounds like nothing more than damage control for that fight because of the backlash they got over it. Because that was, like, th one of the stupidest moments in Volume 7. That was so damn stupid. N no, <laughs> What? That's so... Uh, oh, God. I'm, I'm just... Uh, no. I'm moving on from that one. Clover saw Crow and Tyrion on the wrong side of the law, so we felt like he had to fight both of them no matter what. Okay, so Clover's an idiot. Got it. I mean, thanks. They made sure Team Ruby can't just stomp on the Aesops, but still show their teamwork. Plus, the lack of Clover being there didn't allow for the team to have a cheat code. All they did was have Ruby virtue signal to victory. I mean, seriously, that's the only reason why they won, because they were like, oh, well, Team Ruby's the good guy, they have to win. No consequences to Team Ruby, because there never is. I mean, the Aesop should not have lost that battle. You know, that's the thing, the Aesop should have completely won that battle. You know, people can argue, oh, well, they trained them. Well, here's the thing, we don't know the matter of time that they were trained in. Not only do we not know that, but we also have to take into consideration one more thing. That they're more experienced. You see, this is a problem with Ruby. Power scaling doesn't matter. <laughs> like, you know, if you think Dragon Ball has had some pretty bad and obscure power levels, Ruby takes the cake. Because they take characters like the Aesops who have been trained to be the best in Atlas. And then they lose to, you know, characters that are at the level of Huntsman in training. That is ridiculous. That, I mean, who the hell thought that was a good idea? And Clover being a cheat code? Yeah, I don't know about that, considering uh, how well did his good luck go in that final battle that he had? Oh, right. Because it didn't. <laughs> he just died. So, yeah, so much for cheat codes, because that didn't work out for him. They tried hard to get Maria more scenes, but there was no room for it. What, what was she going to do? I mean, seriously, she already was in Volume 6, and basically her only role was to be there to help Ruby with the Silver Eyes, and even then, they could have had Crow and Ozpin explain that, so there was no reason for Maria to even be in the series anymore. They could kill her off, and it wouldn't matter. It wouldn't do anything for the plot, really. Rin is struggling with some heavy emotional stuff that is not resolved at all this volume, but it is hinted there will be a lot more for him next volume. I mean, what? They solved his issues back in Volume 4, so what emotional stuff out of the blue, how, like, what, what is there for him to take care of? I don't understand this. It makes absolutely no sense. His arc was resolved when they killed the Nukalave. That's dumb. Like, I, I don't know what happened, unless they're trying to make him be the edgelord, which doesn't make any sense. The writers do a lot of people wouldn't be happy with Ren's attitude this volume, but he still cares about Nora, even if he doesn't always communicate it well. I mean, I thought that he was a bro. I mean, when he stood with Ironwood, yeah, I, I thought the guy was a bro. And then, of course, whenever he said that he didn't think that they were ready to be, you know, huntsmen, I mean, I think Ren was pretty on point. Just saying. The drama they added in between Ren and Nora was just dumb. I mean, it was just added drama out of nowhere. Ruby and Oscar's awkward interaction came from them both riding the high of the moment where it seems like they each have great plans that go well. Oh my dear God! What? Oh, who cares? I'm am serious. I, <laughs> I I don't care. I don't care about that. It doesn't that doesn't phase me. I don't care. And thus, White Rose and Lancaster shippers breathe again. But for how long? Oh my! Oh God! Look, 
ship whatever you want. I don't care. So this is basically just trying to say that, oh, Rose Garden isn't a thing or whatever. I don't care. Whether it is or it's not, I mean, then again, I think it's a weird ship, personally. That's my opinion. I mean, hey, people can ship it if they want. That's fine. I think Rose Garden's weird. Mainly because of Ozpin, though. That's like, that's the weird thing to me. That's that's why I think it's just strange. Winter was waiting to be the Winter Maiden her whole life, but in a split second, she gives it all up. No, she wasn't. That's not even true. So, Winter was proposed this by Ironwood after Volume 3. So, no, she wasn't. And also, the Maidens were supposed to be lore. It was supposed to be like myths, right? People didn't know whether it was true or not. So how was she supposed to even know about being the Winter Maiden? So, that to me doesn't make any sense. I mean, that's just dumb. And it retcons... Ironwood proposing the idea to her, and then she deciding to say yes. I mean, like, she didn't have that ambition all her life. Like, what? Well, <laughs> they pulled that out of their ass. You know they did. But Miles realized that Cinder could just blow up the room and bust through the walls. Now, that's supposed to be whenever they were going to get the Winter Maid. Well, then why didn't she do that? I mean, then again, she did blow through the door. So, why didn't they just have her do that? Or whenever her and Winter was in the room... You know, when they were fighting, she just could have blown it up. Why didn't they do that? They could have just ended that fight right there. I mean, come on. At one point, they wanted to show Cinder using maiden magic to bring back some dead Elysian knight back to life to fight Penny. It was going to be some sort of puppet joke. Well, then why didn't they do that? That would have been amazing. I would have loved to see that. Are you kidding me? It, but they expect us to know what magic can do, and they've never even established what all maiden powers are capable of. I mean, seriously. You know, at this point, Cinder could just basically pull anything out of her ass. For all we know, she could pull the five pieces of Exodia out and then just automatically win every single battle she goes into just by obliterating everybody. I mean, seriously, Maiden Magic could basically be whatever you want it to be. <laughs> they expect us to know, oh, well, Cinder could bring back the dead and fight. You know, it would be really great if you just established to us how it actually worked, because that would be nice. And to see Cinder be able to do that, that would be great. But no, they took that away from her, and they don't ever explain to us how maiden magic works. So, yeah, you know, what in the world? <laughs> this is so bad. This is so bad. It's so unorganized. Some characters got more upgrades than others. Let's be real. They shouldn't have gotten them. Weiss is already perfect, so she didn't need any changes. Miles was excited that they were able to give Rin heavy rounds to shoot with. Rin has his father's dagger on his arm. Uh, let me tell you something. Rin didn't do anything in Volume 7. So those heavy rounds didn't do anything. I mean, yeah, okay, so we killed a few Grim. Okay. I mean, that's it. I mean, that's that's literally it. I mean, seriously. It didn't turn out to result in mattering at all. Oz came back at that moment because he heard what Oscar said to Ironwood, and that made him brave enough to return. Oh, so you were creeping the whole time, just as everybody thought. Oh, yeah, well, that's no surprise. Also, Oz should not have come back. In fact, Farm Boy should have been dead, my personal opinion. And I can't stand Shannon McCormick after he docks the fellow YouTuber. So, you know, screw you, Ozpin. And screw you, Shannon McCormick. The Foot Soldiers, AKs, that the Grim are able to overwhelm in only a few seconds, were meant to represent that Atlas wouldn't provide them with much defense against Grim because they don't care enough. So, let me get this straight. They're trying to say that the Kingdom of Atlas doesn't care about Mantle, and so they would just let their foot soldiers just go out there to die because they don't want to give them military power. But then what was the point of bringing back all of your ships then? You know, oh my lord. And they're trying to say that their country, which Atlas is supposed to be based off of a militarized America, so they're trying to say that America would not protect their people, basically. That's the way they see it. Are you kidding me? Miles and Carrie, what the fuck? That is messed up. Like, are you serious? Man, really shows how they don't care about their country. That is disgraceful. Man, that's awful. Ironwood losing another hand represents him losing another part of his humanity, possibly confirming he lost his one organic arm. So, what, is this supposed to be a Star Wars reference? You know, he's more machine than man now? Oh my... Wait, oh, this is... This is agonizing. This is absolutely agonizing. Besides, he didn't even lose that arm. He still has it. It's just burnt. It has to heal. My god. They wanted to make Ironwood's progression into villainy subtle and make sense. He wasn't a villain. 
<laughs> he was a good guy the whole time. Team Ruby were the villains. That's clearly obvious. I mean, seriously, he wanted to perform martial law to try to save people, and Team Ruby wouldn't let him do it. And then, of course, Team Ruby was all on the side of anti- I mean, uh, they were on the side of Mantle. <laughs> you know, and they just let them go around and riot and destroy Mantle while Ironwood was trying to do what he could for the people to try to make it better. I mean, seriously. Team Ruby was awful, and he was also trying to get the relic into space that would be away from Salem so she could never get it. I mean, seriously. Ironwood was doing the right thing. I mean, he really was. I mean, my god. Ironwood was the good guy. Penny was not used to fighting sneaky enemies. So that is how Tyrion got the upper hand. No. No, it didn't, damn it. <laughs> that didn't happen that way. No, it didn't. What happened was she could see him with the night vision, and then she got hacked. I mean, seriously. She's supposed to be a military-owned android. So she should be ready for all combat situations. I mean, seriously. It can be programmed into her. Not that hard. The crew thought everyone would love Jean's new haircut. It was shocked when everybody immediately hated it. Miles wanted to see Jean grow up a bit, so he liked the change. <laughs> <laughs> oh my friend Nobody loved Banana Hair Douchebag's haircut because it was terrible. <laughs> oh Oh man, of course Miles would like it. Of course he would. Oh my god. The reason why he'd like it is because it's his self insert. That's why he loved it. It doesn't show Jean grow, it just shows Jean become more of a douchebag. <laughs> oh god. <laughs> Miles also mentions there was going to be a scene in chapter 3 with Marrow trying to bond with Blake about being a Faunus, and also about him specifically being a Faunus and Atlas, who was a part of Atlas's military team. But that episode was so packed, they wanted to move it to chapter 6. But then that episode also became too packed. But they planned to get back to it in future volumes. Blake already bonded with Sun. Why does she have to specifically bond with Mero over being a Faunus when she's already done that? Also, you could have just told Mero's backstory. You know, the, how the White Fang kind of, you know, put some bad views upon the Faunus, and how he did his best to work to prove that there were good Faunus out there that could, you know, rise up to the top. I mean, seriously, wouldn't have been hard to do. You mean, are you kidding me? I mean, <laughs> I mean, that's not hard to do. Chapter 1. I find it interesting they did toy with the idea of Penny losing her memory or having a clone, but I understand why they didn't. That's something that fits better, a primary plot point, or at least a secondary plot point with a lot of focus, and Volume 7 already has a lot in it. See, here's the thing. Penny died in Volume 3. It was the soul of Pietro that even gave her life in the first place. That should have been an individual soul. This Penny should have easily been a brand new Penny. That's what they should have done. And then, you know, you could have had an emotional conflict for Ruby that way, but seeing that she's become a cynical character that doesn't care about anything anymore, well, you know, it doesn't matter. But, thing is, is that if they were good writers, they would have done it that way. And it would have been a lot different, and it would have been emotional, could have had some growth for Ruby's character, and it could have been a great moment. But, they're bad writers, so, you know, there's that. You see, I do like the reason why Jean cut his hair, and that initiative does give him a sense of growth, and is getting in his eyes so he cut it for practical reasons. That's great. The design just doesn't work for me. The design is trash. I mean, I think anybody can agree to that. But here's the thing. It doesn't give him a sense of growth. It makes him look like a banana-haired douchebag. <laughs> That's what he is. And here's the other thing. What growth? What has his character gone through to grow? I mean, seriously, he hasn't grown. He hasn't changed. I mean, he's just an annoying asshole. I mean, that's what his character is, and he's totally useless. I mean, seriously. Jean sucks. Crow would land in front of Tyrion and say, that's enough. And Tyrion would ask, are you able to talk when you're a bird, or do you have to wait until you're a person to throw your one-liners? You know what's funny is that while that's brought up, Crow didn't turn into a bird once in Volume 7. Not one time. He did not turn into a bird. Also, uh, you know, 
That would be a good way to be able to relay information if they could talk, you know, both Crow and Raven when they were birds. But the thing of it is, is that I don't care enough. Just saying. They struggled a long time with where to put the Neo reveal. Oh boy. Yeah, here we go. Let's talk about Neo. They struggled with this, huh? They struggled with where to put Neo. I mean, you could put Neo anywhere. It's really not that hard. I mean, you can do so many things with Neo's character because she has that, you know, availability. I mean, seriously, you could put her as one of the Elysian guards getting information. Simple. You could put her as, you know, what they did, the waitress. Simple. You know, there's so many different things that you could do, and then you could reveal her in an interesting way. It's really not that hard. Neo's look after Cinder takes the relic and doesn't thank Neo for getting it is setting up some things probably made. Yeah, because everybody anticipates Neo to betray Cinder. I mean, plain and simple. That's pretty much what everybody thinks is going to happen. I mean, I think it could happen too, you know. And that's the thing. It probably will. Wouldn't be shocked. Would not be shocked if they had Neo betray Cinder. But, you know, I mean, seriously, they're going to treat Neo terribly anyways. I just know they are, and I have a bad feeling about it. The Neo versus Orange fight could have been shorter. They called it Orange. I've been saying Orange. And now they're calling it Orange. Well, they ruined it. Now i got to find out a new one. And uh, that Neo fight, yeah, she should have just destroyed Farm Boy, 100%. She should have just destroyed all of them, 100%. There shouldn't have been this Jean teleportation from across the hallway and then just deflecting Neo. That shouldn't have happened. Neo should have been able to also just dodge the fucking Farm Boy because apparently Rooster Teeth and Miles and Carrie, you know, apparently they don't understand how reflexes work and how response time works because within five seconds somebody's screaming at you running down a hallway getting ready to punch you you're gonna dodge i mean you can do that within five seconds i mean seriously oh but wait i don't see anything else oh there was no punch in the face to neo why they let that happen oh right deflect from that am i right oh they're gonna treat her so bad molly made i just know it carrie learned from volume five that having everyone in one room for a fight doesn't work well. You didn't learn anything from Volume 5. What are you talking about? Just because you don't have everybody in one room, you haven't learned a damn thing because the writing's gotten worse. I mean, seriously, Volume 7 proved that. When making the Four Kingdoms, they compared it to parts of the real world. Oh yeah, we already know that. Atlas and Mantle were two different versions of America. Well, we already knew that. This is not any new information because Atlas itself was a militarized America. That's what they stated a long time ago. So this is no new information. I mean... That's obvious. I mean, like, what what is this whole commentary? Like, or well, commentators know it rather. Like, what is this? I mean, this is this is a wreck. Carrie wants to do a show with all the old Ruby characters. How about no? <laughs> How about we don't ruin them any more than you've already done? Let's let's not and say go away. Because the best thing you could do, Carrie, is step away as well as everyone else and let that series go to people who actually know what they're doing. Because that would be great. I mean, I'm just saying. At the beginning of their friendship, Crow doesn't really like Clover and finds him irritating. But eventually it evolved into friendship and later tragedy. See, here's the problem with this. You didn't take enough time to develop the friendship. So, to me, Clover dying didn't matter. Because you didn't really give it enough time to be able to be a friendship. I mean, it's just, oh look, they're on screen together all the time. Ah. I mean, like, that doesn't make me care. Like, that's the problem. You don't give enough time to make me care. You know, that's that's the issue. That and the bad writing. You know, that, that's also a problem. But I'm serious. You know, when it comes down to that, yeah, I, I don't care. I just don't care that it became that. Doesn't matter to me. Paula thought it was important that Blake hold Weiss's hand and be the first to stand by her side when Jacques is yelling at Weiss since Blake knows what it is like to be in an abusive relationship. Oh my dear God. You know what? No. Y you can get out of here with your bullshit because until I see that Blake was abused, I don't believe that. You know, show me the abuse because I'd like to see it. I'd like to see it. Where? where? When did it happen? When did it happen? Come on. I'd like to see it. Please show me. Because until I see it, all I see Blake as is a spoiled little brat that lived in Menagerie. So until you show me that evidence, I don't believe that. And then Ruby and Yang didn't even really know a father would talk like that to his daughter. Oh man, the sheltered life you must live. I mean, you've gone up against criminals, crooks, 
you know, like, villains, but yet you can't believe that a father would talk like that to their daughter. You must not know Weiss then whenever she told Yang about, uh, you know, her relationship with her father in Volume 5. <laughs> but I guess the writers forgot about that, huh? <laughs> I guess that doesn't exist. Nobody has ever offered Penny a fist bump before, so she wanted to do it perfectly. Uh, what? Are you are you kidding me? What? 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 What is this? Like, are you serious? Oh my lord! The lady in the photograph with black hair is not Cinder's mom, which was apparently a fan theory. Well, I, I didn't know that was a fan theory. First off, secondly, I never thought that, that was her mother. I never. Like, I never even <laughs> had an idea of that possibly being your mom. Like, what in the world? Like, what? Oh, man. Okay. Ironwood giving the relic back was his biggest sign of trust. You really had to explain that? No, I mean, I mean really. You, ha you People couldn't have just gotten that by seeing that? You, you That had... What? Really? Okay. Sure. Adding in the Robin encounter... Fuck Robin Hill. Was a late addition to the outline. She wasn't going to be introduced until chapter 6 during her rally. Never should have been introduced. The plot of trying supplies to Robin's plot was a late addition during writing. Never should have been introduced. About the plot of the policy, it was unnecessary and stupid. Absolutely, because all of it was stupid. All of Volume 7 was stupid. All of it. All you had to do was make a plot about the White Fang, and then you could have had Robin Hillary Clinton not be Robin Hillary Clinton. She could have been Robin Hill, you know, based off of Robin Hood. Have it like Robin Hood's story, where he stole from the rich and gave to the poor. I mean, seriously. That would not have been a hard plot line. Just saying. And the White Fang could have been the villains. I mean, come on. It was also the first movement of Clover being a bit uh, duplicious. I mean... They tried to do this whole thing with Clover, you know, trying to make it seem like he may have been a spy or something, but come on. You know, it just phased out to be nothing. So it was like a false tag of him seeming like he was the villain when he wasn't. The mind scene has us seeing the Sheetus Company logo everywhere. Adam, as a terrible person as he was when he was younger, was arguing with someone at a Schneider's company place and the other person grabbed a brand and gave him his scar? So seeing the logo all over the mine was very intentional to put that in the forefront of Blake's mind and Yang notices, Oh, you. So let me get this straight. Adam got the brand because he was arguing with somebody and the Schneider's company place. And... Next thing you know, they just decide to go and brand him? Like, what? That'd be like saying, hey, man, uh, I don't agree with you. Hey, Jeff, you what's up, man? Go brand him. And then just go and brand him right in the eye. Like, what? I would never shop there ever again. You would think that that would give them just a terrible look in general. Oh, my Lord. Like, what? I would have rather this been like he was enslaved by the Shinidas company to show their harsh labor laws, that would have been interesting because it was brought up like that, right, by Blake back in Volume 1. That would have been interesting. And then, of course, he escapes, but he was forever branded, and that could have led him to join the White Fang. I mean, seriously, could have been very simple right there. Very simple. But no. No, they have this. And then they make it about Blake. Oh my freaking god. This is terrible. This is bad. Like, they don't even tell you how Adam became a White Fang member. And they make it all about Blake. This is just frustrating and absolutely pathetic. I, I hate that. I hate that. Many things that seem like retcons are actually not. And instead, it's just Carrie and Miles learning how to tell a story while simultaneously telling a story. So things were not always explained well early on. <laughs> you, you, <laughs> what? You retconned so many things in the story. And then whatever they're like, oh, well, it was never retconned. We were just telling the story. We just didn't explain it right. No, you've retconned this story. This is a joke. This is a joke if I've ever seen one. And the worst part is this isn't even April Fool's. This is the worst, worst damage control I think I've ever seen for anything in my entire life. Oh, my Lord. This is so, <laughs> This is horrible. Miles believes that if Ironwood would allow himself to be more vulnerable, 
more often, things would have gone differently. No, they wouldn't have. No, they wouldn't have. Miles, you're a moron. I mean, seriously. He was extremely vulnerable. I mean, what do you call what Ironwood was the whole time? He was trusting everybody. He was extremely vulnerable. How much more vulnerable could he have been? Like, are you serious? What an idiot. Originally, one pod was going to be broken with the one with Freya being intact. But because Penny is a robot, she could remote interface in and get the powers. But that still felt like stealing, and they didn't want to go that route. So wait, she could have taken the maiden powers the entire time? Like, are you... What? What? Okay, so, yeah, you have retconned the powers in because that's the thing. It was only supposed to be transferred to a female. That was the powers. That was what they explained the maiden powers were. And a robot, an android, mind you, can get them just by stealing them. That's ridiculous. JNRO really are the B team now, huh? Uh, yes, Juniper was always the B team. I don't know how anyone thought they were the main team. They were, uh, like, how, uh, like... Oh my lord, this, this uh, I, I feel like I'm losing brain cells. The fight with the Sentinel Grim was originally supposed to be a bit longer, and there was going to be an alpha variant of the Sentinel, which they imply we will see in the future. Well, guess what? It's not going to matter, because Grim are nothing but fodder. I mean, you know, they've just basically taken the expectation of Grim possibly being something all the way back in Volume 2, saying that the older they are, the more intelligent they are, right? Well, they've basically thrown that out the window. So, that doesn't matter. It will just, you'll die in a few hits. I mean, this is absolutely terrible. I mean, these commentary notes, if they tell you anything, they basically tell you that the writers are garbage. <laughs> like, they have no plans for anything. They just kind of, you know, throw in whatever, wherever. They're trying to create so much damage control to save their own asses when they clearly don't know how to write. They're creatively bankrupt. And also, they're nothing but a bunch of talus hacks and activists. And it shows you that the future of Ruby is doomed. But anyways, let me know what you think about this entire situation down below. Subscribe to the channel if you were new here. And make sure you were still subscribed. Because YouTube is unsubscribing people from all their favorite channels. So make sure you were still subscribed to all your favorite channels. Hit the video with a like. And also be sure to share the video on social media. Spread the word and get it out there. It's greatly appreciated. And it really helps out the channel a lot. Also be sure to follow me on Discord. We have a wonderful community there. Not only that, but it will keep you up to date on when the newest videos will be released. As well as any other upcoming events in the near future. So be sure to follow me on Discord. The link is in the description down below. But anyways. I hope you all have yourselves a wonderful and fantastic day today, and remember, if today was not a good day, tomorrow can always be better. Take care of yourselves and everyone around you, and have yourselves a good one out there, everybody.